of the pandemic has been much heightened in the education sector. The pandemic has changed most of our teaching practices. It also made us rethink what we teach, um, where and when we do our teaching, and how do we deliver content and engage students, and why we do it this way or that way. So, my name is Danilo Madaya Bailen. I'm a professor at the University of West Georgia, which is near Atlanta, if you're familiar. Um, I teach instructional technology, media, and design. Uh, foremost, I am an instructional designer, and by default, an educator. I'm also a researcher. I study different aspects of the learning and teaching enterprise, especially those delivered in different modalities, face-to-face, -face, online, blended, and high flex. In return, the things I learned from my research help me improve my practice. So every day I wear multiple, multiple hats. Uh, designer, definitely. Um, developer, researcher, educator, and mentor. Most days I manage student learning uh, from conceptualizing and designing learning experiences to writing instructions or guides toward completion of artifacts as evidence of learning. So today I'm going to talk about an experience that I've been working with folks at West Visaya State University, which is focused on global learning. Okay. Global learning focuses on building relationships between cultures and developing more culturally aware and sensitive individuals. So what's interesting about this is that um, there are different skills that we usually are familiar with, like communication, collaboration, critical thinking, cultural empathy, community building, and technology literacy, to name a few. But these are what we assume are you know, skills that we develop in the classroom are also very important as our students get out of the classroom and connect with other people, not only in other countries, but in the Philippines in the context of across islands. Okay? Because as you move from north to south, from east to west, you know, culture or the way people behave or perceive things are very different. So this morning, I'm excited to talk more about um, these global learning skills, okay? Critical thinking, communication, creativity, and collaboration. As I said, this is based on my experience for the last three years with a group of students. One is based in the Philippines, and the other one is based in the United States. So as you can see in the map, okay, um, the ones in the Philippines are based in Panay Island, okay, where you are, okay, uh, specifically at West Visaya State University. Uh, the students um, technically are in face-to-face -face mode, if not for the pandemic. However, the pandemic has changed all of that. And so now students are accessing their context, their content, and their teachers using, you know, an online mode. For the other group, okay, uh, which is based in the United States, you know, these are my students, and my students are in an online program. Many of them are pursuing, grad all of them are pursuing graduate courses. Uh, some are masters, and others are specialist degree. So the experience is a global collaboration experience separated by more than 3,000 miles and about a 12 to 13 hour difference. And that's between Georgia and Iloilo City. Okay. Um, it's a 12 to hour because right now, because of the daylight saving time, you know, it's a 13 hour difference. But prior to November 6, it was a 12 hour difference. So, how did I get involved with this? So, four years ago, a colleague of mine died. She's the one who designed and developed the course, okay? 
Uh, however, the design and delivery of the course was a little bit constrained. This was about four years ago uh, because we talk about global learning, but we're not asking our students to connect beyond just, you know, their classmates. And so I thought then that, you know, it's very important to have a very authentic experience, uh, especially working with the subject matter in another context or another country. It would have been easy to ask the students to collaborate with somebody in the other room, in their school building. But that means that to some extent, it's not as authentic as we want it to be. You know, they know each other. Most probably they know their co-teachers. They're familiar with the students. They know the resources. What I want them to experience, my students, is that to have a real life situation, okay? So prior conversation of having this collaboration really talks about developing an international flavor. But the previous faculty wasn't able to do so, you know. And so it was more about writing a proposal on how to do this. And then everything seems very hypothetical. So three, four years ago when I was asked to teach this course, which is called Global Learning and Collaboration with Technology, I thought that the course design and delivery could be enhanced with a more authentic or realistic experience for the graduate students. So I was lucky that I have a connection to West Visayas State University. I am their alumni, you know, I graduated from their high school uh, years ago. And um, the BPAA, who is Dr. DeKilia and I, came from the same high school. So in 2016, I did my academic leave, you know, at West Visaya State University for a semester. And so I got to reconnect with the folks, you know, a lot of the faculty. Uh, most of my teachers then were almost gone, okay? But the gen new generation of teachers at West Visaya is something that I've reconnected and did a lot of professional development work. So there's a familiarity with this work, okay? Um, and so Dr. DeKilia and I talk about how we can make this happen, you know, in terms of what kind of courses she's teaching that we can connect with the courses I'm teaching in the United States. So there were four or five things that is really important for me. One is that, you know, Whatever we're going to do, it has to be a realistic scenario. That means we're talking about implementing something that will be in the classroom, okay? Uh, so it will impact K-12 uh, Filipino students, okay? If not, you know, uh, undergrad Filipino students, okay? It has to have collaboration learning. That means my students in the United States and Dr. DeKilia's students will work together on a project, okay? And each one, you know, contributes something to make it happen. Uh, the third is that there, are, there will be a role differentiation. So my program here in the U.S. is really strong on instructional design, okay? And Dr. DeKilia's students are learning about materials development. So, but Dr. DeKilia's students have access to the learners, the Filipino learners. And so the role differentiation by default, you know, is really put on my students as instructional designers and instructional developers. And for Dr. DeKilia's students, the role differentiation is based on uh, as subject matter experts, okay, and also as implementers, okay, because at the end of the day, whatever is produced by the collaboration, we will implement it and see how it will impact, you know, the, uh, the students in the Philippines. The fourth component that is really important is creative thinking. As you can see, uh, every student in Dr. DeKilia's class, a subject matter expert, teaches something different. Different in terms of content, different in terms of um, students. Some of them are K-12, some of them are undergrad. And so my students in the U.S. have to figure out how to think outside of the box of what can be done, 
okay? But that means that they have to listen to the Filipino partners uh, so that they can come up with a, a better design, a good design. Because as I tell my students in the U.S., maybe your design is great, but if it will not uh, work with the Filipino learners, then really it's a bad design because you have not listened to your subject matter experts. Okay. And then the last piece is about impactful implementation. And this, go and this goes both to the partners, which are the Filipino faculty members or teachers, and to their students. One of the goals that we want to have in this collaboration between my students and Dr. Dekelia's students is that the Filipinos are exposed to the different tools, applications, and resources that are accessible and available to American teachers. Okay. On the other end, the F American teachers, by working and collaborating with Filipino partners, they themselves are exposed to what a developing country educational system looks like. Okay. And what are the possible things that can be implemented. And finally, for the Filipino learners who will be receive the, the receivers of this online learning modules you know they'll be able to experience a different way of teaching okay using technology or using resources you know uh, delivered through technology so these are the five things or the five criteria why uh, in making this collaboration work okay So how does it look like? So for three years, okay, I've been working with students in the Philippines and students in the United States. So we have three cohorts. We started in 2020, 2021, and then now 2022. Right now, my students are finalizing their prototype modules. Okay. So the course only happens every fall semester. 2020 was challenging. We were in the middle of COVID, okay, a pandemic. And so that was a very, that also it was our learning experience, okay. So, so that's the core. So the U.S. students, as I said earlier, pursue master's and specialist degrees, okay, or postgraduate degrees for the specialists. And for Filipinos, um, they're completing their coursework towards a doctoral program, you know, at West Visayas State University. So just looking at the combination of the verbal teams, okay, uh, in 2020, we grouped the teams by grade level. It was the first year that we tried to do this, and we're not sure how to create the grouping. The students complete uh, surveys at the beginning to give us some demographic profile or characteristics and then based on that in 2020 I grouped them by grade levels there were challenges with that approach okay um, it's hard to match because many of the Filipino partners are either uh, faculty in higher education in the Philippines okay and to match them with an elementary teacher in the in, in the US uh, could be problematic to an extent. However, remember I mentioned that the foundation of the master's and specialist program in the U.S. is on instructional design. So when we went to 2021, you know, I basically have a different mantra saying you are instructional designers, you are instructional de developers. It does not, you know, it doesn't matter whether you are an elementary teacher a middle school teacher or a high school teacher, you know, you are functioning as an instructional designer. So we randomly assign in 2021 the groupings based on the information the students provided for us. Okay, and the same thing with 2022. Okay? So um, we talk about differentiation of roles. So. We started with um, an orientation of participants. So I talked to my students in, uh, uh, in the U.S., okay? And then I attended Dr. DeKelia's orientation 
you know, with her students, and I talk about the project. Okay, we collected information about clients. Okay, and then we design learning experience. So, as you can see, for the first one, where we talk about information from clients and designing learning experience, my American students take the lead on this until we get to developing the prototype. So a lot the, the American students are acting as instructional designers and instructional developers. And the Filipino partners are feeding them information. Okay? Not only in terms of the curriculum, but also in terms of the characteristics of the students and about the technology. Okay? Because the issue is that in 2020, 2021, a lot of the schools in the Philippines are still in lockdown mode. Okay. So once the prototype is developed, we have a rollout or a turnover. And so it's given to the Americans, uh, to the Filipino partners, where they deliver the design experience. Okay. So most of these experiences are in modular form. Okay. And the Filipinos, um, in their collaboration with Americans can decide whether they want to directly deliver online or they want to use the website as a repository of materials that they can deliver face to face. Okay. Now, in 2020 and 2021, there was no option. Everything has to be delivered online. Okay. And so it really created a lot of headaches in terms of delivery mode. But now in 2022, where, you know, the schools, whether they're higher ed or deaf ed schools, how are more open, you know, I think they just started opening last month or, yeah, last month, you know, to a face-to-face -face mode. So, so now we have those two options. Okay. So as you can see, this is the cycle that, you know, we are able to differentiate the roles. Now, in terms of developing the activities, okay, whether that's online or face-to-face, -face, we go through this process of planning, designing, developing, delivering, and then evaluating. Okay. So each critical activity area engages team members to communicate, comprehend, collaborate, and build a sense of community with each other. And this is really important. Because uh, even though we're saying, okay, you cannot teach global learning skills, which involves communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity, we are also trying, or I'm also making my students walk the talk, okay? So first, it's really important, you know, at the beginning to be able to set up uh, the time to talk. There's a 12 to 13 hour difference between the two of you. So as you, you know, in the, in, in the U.S., as the student starts their morning, the Filipinos are just ending their day. And the same way that if the Filipinos are starting their day, the Americans are ending theirs, okay? So it's very important as I talk after three years of doing this, this year is really important to create the, to set the tone that you have to build your communication channels. Okay. Because communication is the key to be successful. Okay. So the other piece with communication is listening to the Filipinos. Okay. Uh, in terms of who are the students, what are the issues with technology, and what is the curriculum. Are we teaching the curriculum layered with global learning skills, or are we just teaching global learning skills? Okay. And then the other piece is this whole idea of collaboration. It's really important that the Filipinos are on board at the beginning of the design process. Because the, the issue is that the Americans, for example, this year ends uh, next week, after the first week of December. But the Filipinos have their courses, okay, extends up to just before the Christmas break. And so there is a, I don't want to say there's a gap, but there's a point where the Filipinos are on their own. And that's where they start implementing 
you know, the modules and collecting data to see whether, you know, the module is successful in terms of meeting the goals or the learning objectives. Okay. And so it's really important that um, the Filipinos have the time to implement because they need the time also to write their evaluation reports. Okay. But for the Americans, as of this week, they're done. Okay. Uh, just getting this example. Okay. Uh, what's interesting is that last week I had one-on-one -on -one consultations with my students, okay? And we talk about, you know, what are the things that they are proud of now that they've done with their work? Um, what are the things that they would like to change, okay? And then what are the things that um, they have learned from the process, okay? So I spent time with my students going through that as they finalize their prototype, and then we walk through their modules. And you know, and I gave feedback. One of the pieces that is still really not heightened in this process is the testing. Every time you roll out um, a module, a design module, you need to test it first, okay, yeah. to see if the length, the links are working, or to see how it will work in a mobile phone or a mobile device, okay. Because if students in the Philippines are accessing the materials through their phones, then that website has to work with the mobile device. Okay? And so what we have done right now after three years of doing this is that our testing is really relegated to peer reviews. Okay? So we have a peer review for the design plan and we have a peer review for the prototype. Both Americans and Filipino students are involved with the peer review because it's really important to get as many as much feedback as we can to improve the prototype so as you look at the focus of the learning experience in this slide in 2020 we talk about content global learning as a subject okay then in 2021 we shifted because not the Americans, the feedback that we got from the Americans is that they're not familiar with Filipino curriculum. Okay? And so they're not really going to learn the Filipino curriculum. Part of that's because they have limited time. Okay? Um, and if I remember correctly, in 2020, Philippines started like late, like mid-October. Okay? The Americans started in early August. Okay? So we lost about six weeks of time. And so what happens is, okay, are we okay? Okay, so, so what happens is that, you know, we need to make sure that because of the discrepancy of the starting point, okay, between American students and Filipino students, we have to look at what can be covered. So in 2021, we focused on global learning skills only and not necessarily the curriculum that the Filipino teachers are doing. However, they can use topics, you know, that can be a context for learning, you know, glo uh, for learning the global learning skills. And then in 2022, which is this year, we focus on, you know, global learning as content, okay, for the delivery of the modules. So what were the challenges, you know, given, you know, 2020, 2021, and now 2022, okay? So the first challenge, based on my observations, are partners' perceptions, okay? So it's about capabilities and capacities, okay? And that means that capabilities not only in terms of the individual, but capabilities in terms of the infrastructure okay so one of the things that we the, the the americans and the filipinos struggle in putting a module together is of related to internet connectivity okay so so that really is under capabilities you know what is possible okay capacities is really more of the skill set in terms of instructional design 
all of them, both Americans and Filipinos, are teachers. So they have a good idea how to teach. But to, do, to design an experience requires a more systematic perspective. Okay? And so that's a struggle. My students in the U.S. are maybe at an advantage because many of their courses are based on instructional design elements and principles. But the Filipino partners are not. You know what I mean? They're either taking a curriculum and instruction course, and really it's a small piece of instructional design that they're getting. And so what's interesting is that at the end, it's the American students in a way showing the Filipino students you know, what are possible in terms of instructional design. The other challenge is resource expectations, okay? Uh, that means access to technology and related resources. I always tell when I talk about this that American stud students or American teachers are spoiled, most of them, because of the availability of technology tools and application in the US. And so they can pick and choose. However, in the Philippines, because of internet connectivity, it's really limiting, you know, to the Filipino teachers. Okay? And most of the time, many of them are not familiar of thousands of applications that are available on the web. So resource expectation is a big challenge. Okay? Also, we talk about design experience as a challenge. I kind of alluded to this, okay? That although both uh, my American students are novice, yet in terms of instructional design, in terms of systematic uh, course design, However, you know, they have practice experience, a practice-based experience. For Filipinos, it's almost nothing, but they also have a practice-based experience. Um, the fourth challenge is constant engagement, interactive communication. So my students and their American partners have to figure out what's the best way to communicate, WhatsApp or text messenger or Facebook. So in the first year we started this, we, we used Google Doc where people can type their stuff, but that does not work. So, so the students, the partnership or the team has to figure out what kind of tools will work for, for, for their relationship. Okay. So uh, they want to find an application that um, provides constant engagement and an active exchange. One of the things that my students told me is they have to find an app that has a sound notification. Because, you know, because of the 12 hour difference, if there's no notification that comes in the form of a sound, it's easy to forget, you know, messages. The fifth challenge was active collaboration. You know, we always talk about consultation, input, clarification. Okay. Also, we talk about responsive relationship building. So the idea is that Americans should have questions, okay? And then the Filipinos provide input, and then the Americans will clarify, okay? Because as I tell my students, you cannot make assumptions, okay? It's really important for you to clarify don't ever assume that you know what your Filipino partner is telling you about. Okay? So this is where we talk about responsive relationship building. And then the sixth challenge is um, learner's response. Okay, So we also need to prepare the target audience for this. So remember that the Americans and the Filipino partners is developing an online module. And that will be delivered to Filipino K-12 learners or Filipino undergrads. So we need to prepare that population because this is something different. Sometimes students get excited about something innovative or something novel, okay? Or sometimes they're scared and they don't want to participate. So it's really important for the Filipino partners to prepare their students in such a way that they're open to the idea of an innovative, you know, or a different way of teaching.
But when I ask my students, what is the biggest challenge, you know, in terms of this collaboration, in terms of this partnership, they said it's a really about distance and time. The 12 hour difference takes time to get used to, okay? And even me today, you know what I mean? Uh, I have to feel, always think, okay, it's, it's morning in the Philippines the following day and it's evening here in the US to make sure that I don't miss that or else, you know, I won't be talking in front of you, okay? So the, the session, uh, after almost three years, um, prove this particular event that I'm in front of you here sharing is that it's an opportunity to look back and account for what has been learned that need to be considered for future iteration of this learning experience. Also, it is an opportunity to think deeper about what it means to collaborate and the gains from such an experience. Finally, this is an opportunity to frame such efforts that my students have put in, okay, as an innovation, to innovate in a sense that it pushes the lines of familiarity in traditions, the serving as barriers to achieving more. At the end, I'd like to talk about how we, we need to embrace the change in the way we teach and learn. Because we know better. Okay? We know that we cannot be docile or inactive to the invitation of engaging our students into the 21st century. So as I prepare for this session, I talk about, I identify consideration, collaboration, and innovation. And these are the things that I would like to talk more with you. So, consideration. So, three years ago, we got COVID. Okay? And COVID has really changed the way we do things. For Filipinos, you got locked down. In the U.S., we did temporarily had a lockdown, but in less than six months, we're able to open up. So, I'd like to talk about considerations in terms of what are the things that need, you know, to be considered or reconsidered after three years of pandemic? So, there are six things here that I've identified that I'd like to talk more. One is the challenge of remote versus online teaching. So, remote is teaching online by the fly of your pants. Okay? That means, you know, you're trying to do as much as you can and you're trying to survive because there are things that you know you cannot teach face to face but really as we move forward okay we need to start thinking of moving from remote teaching to online teaching be more systematic think of your audience okay do a learner analysis okay do a concept mapping of the tasks that students need to do okay um, look at your schedule. What is possible? Can you deliver some of these things online? Or some, can you deliver some of this face-to-face? -face? <clears throat> if you're going to lecture, then maybe move that online compared to hands-on experiences. Okay. So that's the first thing that needs to be considered as we move forward. The other piece is experience and designing learning for diverse learners. Although the Philippines is quite homogenous okay, in terms of demographics, the biggest diversity in the Philippines is access to the technology. Okay? And so if you are going to design <clears throat> your course to do more online delivery, you have to think of who your students are and what kind of devices they have access to. And not only access to devices, but will they get access to the internet, which is the third one? A lot of the work that I do in rural Philippines are really impacted by access to the internet, okay? So it's either the internet is slow or the internet is non-existent, especially in you are living or residing in mountainous areas. 
So these three challenge of remote versus online teaching experience in designing uh, learning for diverse learners and access to the internet kind of go hand in hand looking at the context, okay? the context of teaching in the Philippines. Now, in terms of the individual, okay, in terms of you, the teachers, uh, in terms of working with students, um, it's really important that nowadays collaboration is good. Okay, so there's a lot to learn from each other. Okay, and so we need to provide spaces, you know, that you know people can talk about things. People can tell what, what is working and what is not working, what is helpful and what is not helpful. So the expectations to collaborate, you know, okay, is really important to consider as we move forward. Okay. Sometimes maybe team teaching, okay, is could could work out. Maybe collaborate in terms of building new artifacts like video could work out. Especially if you are teaching with other faculty or other teachers who covers the same topic. At the individual level, okay, especially in working with technology, a demonstration of patience and flexibility. Okay. Nothing will work perfect. Okay. There are always gonna be problems with technology. There's always going to be a problem uh, with your students in terms of how they access things. And so you need to have lots of patience and a lot of flexibility. And so that means in designing experiences, you need to kind of build in that patience and flexibility. Especially when typhoons come through, you know, passes by Panay Island, okay, or passes by the Philippines or earthquakes or other calamities, you know, that stops, you know, the learning process or stops the teaching process. And then at the end is this idea of cross-cultural issues, okay? Um, maybe not as much in the Philippines, but it is very apparent as I listen to Filipino partners talk about, you know, rural, those who come from rural areas, and those who come from, you know, the urban areas. There's a big difference between the main campus of West Visayas compared to the satellite campuses in terms of faculty, in terms of capacity, in terms of students. Okay. Um, there's a lot of difference on how students access their materials if they are in the Kalino campus or Pototan or Haniwai compared to Big and Iloilo. So the cross-cultural issues may not be as very similar to cross-cultural issues in the U.S., but it's about differences and similarities of access or of resources. So these are the things that needs to be considered, you know, as we move forward with this model. The other piece that I'd like to talk about is about collaboration. You know, which is really the process of two or more people or organizations working together to complete a task or achieve a goal. So as a faculty, as a researcher, as a designer, I'm collaborating with uh, faculty at West Messiahs, okay? My students are collaborating with Filipinos, okay, partners, you know, to generate an artifact, to generate a product, okay, to complete the task. And so what's interesting is that, remember, we started in 2020, so th about three years ago. And so as you can see, these are the outputs of my collaboration with Dr. Dekilia, okay, with West Messiah's faculty. So as you can see, we, we had an international conference presentation, we had a book chapter, out of the work that we have done. We have another a conference paper published. I did a keynote presentation about the work at another international conference. Uh, I presented at my university. Uh, we, with Dr. Kilia, we got a research grant proposal approved at Western Science. Okay. 
Uh, we have a virtual faculty development going on right now at West Desires based on what we learned from the experience. Um, we had an article submission, you know, in another journal. Uh, I did a university address for West Desires last August. And I got a grant funding here at my university related to this work. And then I was informed by Dr. Kilia that the year two group, that's the group in 2021, they're able to use their evaluation report to be involved in a locally held conference. So our collaboration, not only in terms of the work that was done, you know, in terms of developing the modules, or designing and developing the modules. But it also helps, you know, Dr. Dekele and I to disseminate what we have done. And in a way, hoping to convince people that there is a possibility with this, okay? And as you can see, we have, for the last three years, we have 50 plus American students that has gone through this process, okay? We have involved about 30 plus Filipino students to this process. And, you know, for the last three years, we have six courses, three in the US and three in the Philippines that has been involved with this design process. So the last piece that I want to talk about, aside from consideration and collaboration, is talking about innovation. So the question is, what makes this innovative? You know, it's, what, okay. And so there are three things that I want to talk about in terms of innovation. Access, models, and training. Okay. So one of the common comments that I get from students, you know, especially by American students, is that, you know, well, the Philippines is difficult to design because they have problems with internet connectivity. And so I have to step back and listen to them and listen to myself and say, okay, so yes, that is a problem, okay? But as I move forward with this project, you know, and as I said, over the last three years, we have to accept that this is the reality, that internet connectivity will is a problem, okay? So that means that, you know, in any problem-solving um, um, context, you know, we have to walk around the problem and come up with a more creative solution, okay? So, so at the end, connectivity is not a problem, it's a reality. That's a given. And so we need to think about, okay, now that we know that yeah, internet will always be a problem. What else can we do, okay? So that, you know, we can help the students, the K-12 students or the undergrad students in the Philippines, the Filipino partners, and also, you know, the American students learn about instructional design, you know, and instructional development. So, so that's one, okay? The other piece is this whole idea of models of teaching. So models of designing, models of teaching, are very embedded in Western philosophies or Western perspective. But what is really important is that when you work with Filipinos, Filipino students, Filipino teachers, culture comes into play. And so in creating models of what will work in the Philippines, you have to think of the Filipino culture. You have to think of where the students are coming from and where the teachers are coming from. So it's really important to revisit how culture impacts, you know, the diffusion of this innovation. Okay. How do you want this to trickle down? But you need to understand where the Filipinos are coming from. Because if you don't, then the design will become a failure. So one of the things that I'm trying to bring in is, and I hope a lot of you is familiar with this, is that this whole idea of um, diffusion of innovation. Okay, so Everett Rogers wrote this years ago. Okay, that you know when you try to do something new, 
or you try to introduce something that is a change, there are really four groups of individuals that you have to deal with. The first one, the two to five percent, are what we call the innovators. So they're the ones who jump in and say, hey, this is great, you know, we need to do this. Okay? But on the opposite end, about 60% would say, no way. You know, these are the loggers. No way that they will turn on their email. No way that they will use PowerPoint. No way they will look at the website. For them, you know, technology or ch this particular change is nothing. Down with the change. Now, many of us, okay, are either what we call the early majority or the late majority. Okay? So the point is that about 60, 70% of your students or your faculty, if you're doing faculty development, are more open to the idea. Some of them are earlier than others, okay? And some of them are, they're catching up, but they're a little late. But then you have about 13.5%, okay, who are what we call early adapters. So they're not the jump, the ones who jump, okay, initially, but once you show them, then they're more open to the idea. So given what I just shared with you in terms of designing learning experiences in challenging times, yeah, most of the time if you have a class of 20, okay, about 70% of that will be okay, you know, if you're using technology, you know, but maybe one or two will be jumping, you know, and say, hey, this is great. Okay. But we have maybe about four, okay, okay, or three or four, say, no, this is difficult. This is too difficult for me. So this framework is really important when you try to innovate or you try to introduce change like moving your course online, or doing a blended, or doing, you know, uh, what you call this, a high flex delivery mode. You have always to think that there's always gonna be a group of students or a group of faculty who will resist, okay? And there'll be one or two students or faculty who will, you know, be really excited and love. So, so that's one thing that I think like us to, to, to think about, okay? So, as I said, not everybody is on board when this change happens, okay? And most likely only a third is going for it, okay? Or two thirds, let's put it that way. Oops, sorry. The other piece is about cultural dimension. So it's again, you know, I talk about uh, diversity of learners, okay? But when we look at the Filipino culture, where do we stand, okay? Uh, Hofstein, you know, had these cultural dimensions, okay, that he talks about. So are we talking about small power distance to big power distance? Are we talking about individualism in term, compared to collectivism? More masculinity compared to femininity? Uncertainty avoidance to low uncertainty avoidance? long-term and short-term orientation, indulgence, and restraint. So what's interesting, if you look on the left side, okay, this is more used to characterize, you know, developed countries, okay, or people from developed countries. And then if you look on the right side, okay, these are more characterization of those who came from developing countries. So, one of the interesting things because Filipinos have been socialized in different cultures and different orientation, you have to look at your class, you know, your group of students and say, where are they in this spectrum, okay? Are they more, when they work in groups, are they more individualistic compared to more, collectivi uh, more collectivists, okay? Uh, are they high uncertainty avoidance, so they're okay for them for things to be ambiguous, or they're low uncertainty avoidance. Do they want something very concrete, okay? Or are they really open, or they're really restrained in terms of embracing something new? So that's something that, you know, the third point that I want you to consider when you talk about innovation, or introducing innovation. Sorry, okay. So the other piece is 
these five stages in the decision innovation process. So if you are planning an innovation like what I'm doing in, uh, with Wesley Science and my students in the US, okay, it's really important to look at that there are five stages, okay? Knowledge, persuasion, decision, implementation, and confirmation. So what we have done uh, in my work with these two groups of students is that to provide initial knowledge, okay? So I participated in their, participate, uh, in their orientation, I provided information, okay? and then I'm hoping that we'll persuade them to try it. So again, given the diffusion of innovation model, I know there's a couple of students who are going to be screaming and kicking, okay, in terms of resisting the change. Okay? They're not happy about it. So one of the things that I do to facilitate the persuasion is to look at the demographics or the background of the students and ask them, you know, and pair them so that, you know, their peers are able to influence instead of their faculty. And then, you know, they have to decide, you know. So so for many in a, in a instructional context, you know, they have to decide or else they fail the class, right? What do you mean? So that's really important. But in actuality, it's really about reject and accept. So as students can still accept the challenge, but they will not do good work, you know. So deep inside, they're rejecting it. So that's really important for a faculty to think about, you know, when you are implementing change or you're trying to get to convince your students to embrace change. Are they, you know, are they doing a passive aggressive with you? Okay. So they say, okay, I'm okay with it, but deep inside they're rejecting the idea. Or are they fully on board in terms of accepting the idea that will move them forward to implementation? And then finally, you have confirmation. So they're trying to look at what others are doing. And so one of the things that will help with confirmation is to do a peer review. So not only they're looking or asked to look at other people's work, okay, but also to um, to give to receive feedback from others about their own work. Okay? So in that sense, you know, you have confirmation. So, at the end, I can say that the possibility is endless in designing learning experiences, especially in these challenging times of creating uh, innovative solutions, of pursuing non-traditional research, of teaching and reaching out to new populations, and of charting new paths to support professional development. As you can see in the slide, you know, it's pretty white, and there's one person in there. That could be you, okay? But, you know, like, a, you know, like a canvas, it is bland, okay? The room is empty, but, and you can fill it up, right? You can create drawings or put things in there, okay? One of the interesting things is that um, a colleague of mine, uh, gets to see my office and said, okay, and he said to me, well, you need a big office. And I said, no, I don't need a big office. But he said, you have so much stuff, okay? And I said, yeah, I know. Uh, my response to him, well, you know, there's a bigger office next door. And I said, well, let's put it this way. If you give me a big office, it will still going to be crowded because I'm going to fill it up, okay? <laughs> so what the point is, um, you don't have to fill it up. You know, you can make decisions. You can make choices. Okay? Um, but you have to look at the need. So, what's the need of the students? What's the need of the faculty? Okay. Um, because you need to respond to the demand, or you need to respond to it. Okay, that's really critical. So, given the work I'm doing in the Philippines, okay. Uh, in terms of designing learning experiences, it's really important, you know, as I talk to my students, listen for the need, okay? Because only then you can create something that is powerful, that is impactful to your target population. You have the power to make things happen, but you have to listen. 
So in terms of being innovative, being able to, uh, to respond to the need, okay? This particular innovation, as I call it, is not something new. However, to make it happen, you have to pull all the strings, okay? You need to have collaboration with faculty in the Philippines. You need to be able to persuade, you know, students that this is feasible, okay? And then, you know, sometimes you need to hold hands. Because people are concerned. People are scared. People don't want to lose their A, okay? They want to get a better grade. So as a faculty or as, a, as an instructional designer, as a, you know, as a developer, you have to listen for the need. So again, for designing learning experiences in challenging times, you need to think of consideration, collaboration, and innovation. Thank you very much for attending the session. I hope there's something here that you can take away. But I believe we have time to answer questions. You can type your question in the chat area, or some, you can open the mic and ask.